Creationism versus Evolution, Part 9. Let's go to this K0, oh, this K13, K13.htm. Pick up, pick up the zero. All right, there we go. Use this, K13.htm. And we look for the Bible further teaches. If you are T H E R, T H E R teaches that all human beings have descended from one human pair. Eve was the mother of all living. Acts seventeen twenty six. God made of one every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and that these first human beings were created directly by God, wholly apart from any evolutionary development of man's body from animal forms. <clears throat> With the fall of man, a new order of things ensued. Not only in God's spiritual economy with respect to man, but also with respect to the earth itself, which was cursed for man's sake. The whole creation was delivered into the bondage of corruption, decay, groaning and traveling and pain together. And it was at the time of the Edenic, Edenic curse of Genesis 3, 17 to 19, that the creation was subjected to vanity, decay, the vanity of which the book of Ecclesiastes speaks so eloquently is further described as the bondage of corruption, which is the explanation for the fact that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together into now. This passage teaches very clearly that some tremendous transformations took place in the realm of nature at the time of the curse in the garden, the Edenic Garden of Eden. And therefore, any scientific theory which purports to explain the history of life on this planet without taking into full account the effects of the fall upon the realm of nature must be rejected. That's dogmatic, but having studied the Bible and found no error so far, and corroboration completely with the plausibility of certain things appearing on the earth the way they do, the way we observe them, uh, I find that the Bible is to be taken seriously. So you don't reject it offhandedly because it's not something you believe in. You, you reject it offhandedly because something is incorrectly explained in the Bible according to scientific observations. The antediluvian earth had mountains, rivers, seas, and so must have experienced geological activities similar like those of the present era. <coughs> earth and plea flood times had mountains, rivers, and shallow seas. The water prevailed 15 cubits higher than the highest mountain in order for the ark to float over it fully loaded, and the mountains were thereby completely covered. So we're talking about mountains there. Then the flood waters covered it completely. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their hosts. So God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. So it was good. Now, the upper waters in the beginning of creation were therefore placed in that position by divine creativity, not by the normal processes of the hydrologic circle of the present day. <clears throat> the upper waters did not, however, obscure the light from the heavenly bodies. Scripture describes these upper waters as an expanse or a firmament from the heaven, the Hebrew word transliterated rakia a composite consisting of a flattened out metallic sheet, metallic light sheet, which the Bible describes as being layered on either side with ice. A solid crystalline ice composite is proposed by Dr. Carly Ball, which was created by God approximately 11 miles up in the stratosphere, with the hydrogen atoms being so super cold as to act as a fiber optic superconductive metallic substance. The composite not only permitted heavenly body light to shine through, but magnified it as well in color and fiber optically conducted the sun's light all the way around the earth in a pink hue. 
The metallic properties of this crystalline frozen water composite canopy would then enable it to be held in place by the Earth's magnetic field. Metallic, hydrogen, H2O, hydrogen is a metal. Such a solid crystalline ice metallic hydrogen canopy over the Earth would have profound effect on the Earth's biology and climates, and hence on its geological characteristics, which would be quite different from today's characteristics. <clears throat> Presumably, before the flood, the Earth's crust was in a state of general equilibrium, although the great pressures of the fluids locked within the great deep made it a precarious state of equilibrium. The principle of isosity, uh, is, isosity equal weights, okay, requires that at some datum level deep in the crust, pressures due to the superincumbent materials, materials laying on top of one another, would by everywhere con constant in order for a crustal equilibrium to be maintained, be everywhere. Thus, regions of high topography must be regions of low density and vice versa. Probably there were no very substantial regional differences in land densities before the flood, and correspondingly no very large regional differences in elevation, shallow seas and not really high peaked mountains. Mountains were relatively low and ocean beds relatively shallow as compared with present conditions. <clears throat> so, pre-flood land, ocean, and climate were different. Whatever the source of the deluge of the flood rain, the mass of waters which descended to the earth could hardly have been elevated back into the heavens because it is not there now. This can only mean that much of the waters of our present oceans entered the oceans at the time of the flood. This in turn implies that the proportion of land area to water was larger before the flood, but perhaps very much larger than at present. More sea than land now. Much of the present sea bottom was once dry land. Very likely in order to accommodate the great mass of waters and permit the land to appear again, great tectonic movements and isotatic isostatic adjustments would have to have taken place, formally forming the deep ocean basins and troughs and elevating the continents. This seems to be specifically implied in, in uh, Psalm 104, 5 to 9. That this passage refers to the flood rather than to the initial creation is evident from the last verse, which refers to God's promise that a world-covering flood would never again be visited upon the earth. Certainly, therefore, the Bible makes it abundantly plain that the events associated with the deluge were of immense geological potency and must have caused profound geologic changes. <clears throat> now, how long it was between man's creation and his fall, the Bible doesn't say. In any event, it is very unlikely that any of the fossil-bearing geologic strata are attributable to that period, for fossils plainly tell of death and suffering. Although the sentence of death was specifically pronounced only on man and on the serpent used by Satan as the vehicle of temptation, the most obvious implication is that this curse on the master of creation, Adam, extended likewise to his dominion. This fact is also implied by the New Testament expositions of the fall. Paul says, by man came death. And in another place, by man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Similarly, Romans 8.20, the creation was subjected to vanity. As already noted, most of the fossil deposits give evidence of sudden burial and therefore betoken cat catastrophic uh, kinds of events. The whole appearance of the falciferous rocks seems to completely be out of harmony with the system of creation which God so many times pronounced in the Genesis 1 as very good. <clears throat> Therefore, we feel compelled to date all of the rock strata which contain fossils at once living creatures as subsequent to Adam's fall. It seems likely, furthermore, that relatively few of these strata, if any, can be dated during the period between Adam's fall and the flood. This is primarily because geologic activity seems to have been very mild during that time, and because such deposits as may have been formed then were most likely reworked during the flood, far more violent. <clears throat> Since the deposition of sediments is conditioned upon their precedent erosion, 
by water or wind. And since these elements evidently acted in a uniformly gentle manner, it follows that there could have been very little geological work accomplished during this period before the flood. And we consider volcanic and tectonic activity. This is inferred from the fact that breaking up of the foundations, fountains of the great deep, which implies this sort of activity, was one of the immediate causes of the deluge. Therefore, it must have been restrained previously. The phrase the great deep is used in the scripture to refer both to the waters of the ocean, Isaiah 51.10, and subterranean waters, Psalm 78.15. <clears throat> the one deep, Hebrew tehom, is also used to refer to both types of terrestrial waters. The primeval deep of Genesis 1-2 was, as we have seen, segregated into waters above and below the firmament, so that these waters in whatever location are evidently intended by subsequent references to the deep. Presumably, great portions of the waters were entrapped below the crust and in pockets within the crust during the first three days of creation. Because of the high temperatures and pressures, they undoubtedly were very effective solvents, creating either chemical-rich crustal waters or water-rich magmas. Magmas meaning molten volcanic rock. So it seems, however, that these were either completely or in large measure imprisoned during the antediluvian period, perhaps steadily building up temperatures and pressures until finally the crust gave way at some point of weakness. Yielding of the crust at each, even one point, would result in escape of magmas and water or steam would then lead to earth movements causing further fractures until, as the scriptures portray so graphically, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. Truly, this was a gigantic catastrophic event, besides which the explosion of the largest hydrogen bomb or of hundreds of such bombs becomes insignificant. Thus, the biblical record implies that the age between the fall of man and the resultant deluge was one of comparative quiescence geologically. Temperatures were equally warm. There were no heavy rains nor winds and probably no earthquakes nor volcanic emissions. Probably a larger ratio of land surface to water surface existed than at present, but the atmosphere was maintained at a comfortable humidity by the low-flying, low-lying mist rising from an intricate network of seas underground and mildly flowing rivers. Genesis 1, 10 and 2, 10 to 14. Evidently fed partially or largely by gentle springs. We'll look at the scriptures here on these passages. Pre-flood. So there was universally a warm climate throughout the whole planet. The most significant of these biblical inferences about the pre-flood times is that of a universally warm climate with ample moisture for abundant plant and animal life. It is significant that fossil remains everywhere in the world and throughout the geologic column testified to just such a condition. The falciferous rocks have been erroneously divided into geological ages in the uniformitarian system. And it is significant that practically all of these so-called ages are inferred from the organic and physiographic character of the deposits to have been universally mild and warm. All the falciferous sediments comprising the entire geologic column above the Proterozoic or even the Archaeozoic in places give virtually unanimous testimony to the world then that then was one of mild climate, essentially uniform and throughout the world. The standard geological references, of course, speak of these strata in terms of chronological ages, and in those terms we would say that the strata indicate that the Earth's climate has always, at least until the most recent geologic epochs, been basically warm and uniform, with only mild seasonal and latitudinal variations. Note that this coincides with the hypothesis of a single post-Diluvian short-term ice age. If one thinks of the strata as having been largely deposited catastrophically, especially during the deluge, then their testimonies of a single antediluvian era having such a climate. So we'll continue this. Here again, a great difficulty for uniformitarian geology, how to account for such a remarkable state of things in terms of this non-uniform.